Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. with Turn the Page podcast, and our guest today is... I am Robert P. O'Tone, and I am an author from Long Island, specifically East Islip. And you are here to talk today about um, your most recent book that I finished uh, a few weeks ago. Um, It might be a little bit longer when this podcast airs, but um, it is called Her Infernal Name. And yep. then there are other stories within it, um, and it is horror, and it is really, really good. Oh, thank you. That's <laughs> so, awesome. thank you. So the first, so the 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 story that gives the main name to the book is almost like a novella. Yes. Yeah. So uh, talk to us about that one because I was definitely intrigued. It was almost like a slow burn. And I wasn't sure um, where it was going until the fuse really began to pick up, but the mood was beautifully set. Oh, thank you. Uh, That one specifically comes out of my, uh, I wrote it at a time where I was very stressed out about my college loan. And I wanted to write a story about my college loan debt um, in a way that I, I thought could be scary and fun and approachable for people and then um i wanted to kind of drizzle in a little bit of the uh the concept of fear of missing out and this whole book was written obviously before you know coronavirus and everything so there's nothing in there uh specifically about that but at the same time the fear of of losing time the fear of missing things missing out on adventures that you could be having i really wanted to put that in there as well. So I had sort of those two concurrent fears running through the whole thing. And I always like to have a novella in my collections. Um, And this one, actually, I was writing it for an anthology that I was going to submit to. And then I was just, I just kept going and going and going. And it just, it ended up too long. So I couldn't even submit it. So are you, uh, so tell me a little bit about um, how you began writing horror, Um, how, I I know you've participated in other uh, programs that the library has had, specifically uh, the DJ McHale evening, um, which was fantastic uh, as another, as another person who was intrigued and traumatized by both Uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? And also the Alvin Schwartz books, which I know we've talked about. Uh, It's always fun to hear how other children of a similar era come to love horror. Yeah. Um, The DJ McHale uh, interview and and night with him was incredible. And I I asked the question, or I I think, I I don't even think I really asked the question. I think I just said thank you to him. It was um, my father and I, would literally look forward to it all week. We would look forward to Are You Afraid of the Dark every single week. And my both of my parents are horror junkies. My father passed away in 2019, and that's when I really decided to go full bore into writing horror. Um, but growing up with the two of them, they were nothing but supportive in showing me horror things and I, I you know the, the idea that horror movies warp people I guess it warped me and that it makes me want to write horror and I watch horror all the time and I read horror all the time um, but other than that I, I feel like I'm relatively normal um, so there's nothing to indicate that it's turned me into a serial killer um, or at least that I won't admit to it so in regards to you know where it comes from my my uh, my dad he and I would watch Jaws. It was his favorite movie. It is, for us on Long Island, I think specifically, it's probably the scariest movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and my mom was showing me Alien and <laughs> Aliens and all of these things. And I, I really love the Toho Godzilla movies. So, like, there was a lot of horror all the time in my house. I actually have, I, I know this is an audio thing, but I have Haddonfield right up there. A uh, little, little picture 
autographed by the original Michael Myers himself. Nice. And um, yeah, so Halloween was always my favorite time of year. It was my dad's favorite time of year. It's changed a little bit since he's gone now, but at the same time, that love of horror, I decided to, along with, I, I wanted an, an emotional and um, sort of a uh, psychological um, way of dealing with losing my dad. I wrote my first collection and all of that was me. Well, not all of it, but, but a good most of it is me working through a lot of those emotions and conflicting feelings I had about losing him. And um, I sort of did that in one of the stories in this collection as well. Uh, sort of the, the sort of me exercising the last of, of some of my feelings that I have. I still have a lot of feelings obviously, but in terms of carrying it on from the first collection to this one, that's really the only connective tissue. And so all of the stories are, um, like I said, very good. The, so the first one where you talk about the student loans and um, the fear of missing out, it's very focused on influencer culture as well. Um, and I think like the most recent horror for me about influencer culture has been realizing that through this pandemic, a lot of librarians have become influencers because, because authors like yourself and also just, you know, the traditional publishing houses have kind of been like, hey, librarians, our authors can't do book tours. Can you do videos and podcasts? It came to like this shock of myself to be like, oh my God, are we, are we influencers now? But the the two main characters in that story, so you have um, Shoshana, who goes by Shosh, mm -hmm. and then there's Royce, who is an influencer who is maybe a teenager, <laughs> um, possibly a teenager, who is living this crazy life, and uh, Sho Shoshana is dealing with trying to pay her bills and her student loans and employment that's shaky and then she becomes fascinated with Royce who's living in this crazy apartment and I mean it almost like to me it's almost like it's almost like something like like out of a nightmare like you know like is this really happening like is this girl really living this life where all these people are partying at her apartment and she's only 15 and she has all this money and the two worlds come together which i i thought was so interesting thank you thank you i i um i've always had like this weird interest in influencer culture um and i i've I actually know I recently so even after I wrote the the story I actually met someone who's sort of kind of an Instagram sensation in the way that Royce sort of is but she's older she's not a 15 year old thank god um she's probably 29 or 28 or something like that and I met her and she's a and I and I'm not going to name names but she is a remarkably unremarkable person perfectly nice but there's nothing to like there's nothing seems like a nice girl I don't know but um she's she's like a friend of a friend of a friend and we hung out two nights and in those two nights she kept talking about how she was getting all these offers from men to fly to different areas and go on there and I was like holy dish. but I think <laughs> so, but, but I will I will reverse it okay so okay. um so, yeah offers she, from men yeah she was getting tons of offers from these these guys and they were from all kinds of walks of life there were guys who had a ton of money there was like normal college guys stuff like that and i was really kind of and i had heard about this you know you hear about these things when you read about these influencers and stuff and especially young women um but it was incredible to see it actually happening literally sitting there with this girl um I could not, could not believe it, that it actually was a legitimate thing. But I, I also think a lot about these young um, children who become these influencer type characters. Uh, and it's, it's happened with so many, and then they just kind of fizzle out and yeah. they get older and then everybody loses interest in them. And I, I was sort of thinking about that when I was making Royce and, I didn't, I wanted to make her real because I, as you know, I'm a teacher as well. 
And I've, I've, I've been fortunate to have students who are very, they're firing on all cylinders and it's not so much like their attention needs commanding at all times or anything. It's just, they have so much going on. So they're not super focused. And I really wanted to give that to her as well. Um, because a lot of the, a lot of 15 year old girls that I have met do have a lot going on, whether they're doing sports or they're doing this, that, and the other thing, they've got a ton going on. So I wanted Royce to sort of share that with them. So I wanted to make her sort of realistic, but at the same time, given so much. There's a lot to her that I'm not going to ask in the podcast because I don't want to give anything away, but it really unfolded in ways that surprised me. And she did feel real. And so did Shosh. And I think like just that whole age gap. Um, I mean, I remember the first time I started hearing the term influencer and I'm like, what's that? And then right. I'm like, oh, right okay, that's a thing. Um, and then sort of, like I said before, sort of coming to the acceptance that what we do on our podcast, on the podcast here, and some of the other stuff that we've been doing, especially during COVID, sort of fits in with that. Um, but, th but there is, there's this whole just world of these people who are famous for putting themselves out there on YouTube and they gather fans who want to be like them. I know um, one of my friends uh, had to cut off YouTube for her son because she would hear him talking to himself and he'd be like, please like and subscribe. And at what age is it really, you know, as like a parent, are you comfortable with your child being out there? I mean, it's a whole other world than um, stage parents who oh, yeah. put their put their kids out there because you don't need a producer or an agent to pick you up to get your name out there. And that poses all sorts of other problems, not yeah. the least of which that Shoshin Royce experience, because <laughs> that is in and of itself for the reader to experience. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's fascinating too to look at you know I see it in my own niece and nephew they watch a lot of YouTube and I hear them picking up certain pieces of vernacular that I've never heard before until I started you know looking at some of the YouTubers that they look at saying things like oh that's so uh, satisfying using the term satisfying to describe things and just very strange to me and it's like you're seven you don't know, <laughs> like you shouldn't be using that term or you shouldn't know what ASMR is. And I don't even know what that is actually. <laughs> it's like this weird whispering thing where people make like, they hold like a can like a bottle up to this microphone and they're like, it's so weird. I don't get it. Yeah, you know, it's weird because um, we have, um, in my family, we are Luddites who have not exposed our children to YouTube. <laughs> um, in the beginning, uh, and I'm not one of those parents who say no screen time. My kids grew up watching reruns of Fraggle Rock and music videos. Nice. Um, but we kind of decided um, after watching a bunch of videos, but, you know, there's funny cat videos and then there's videos that might not be funny to the cat. Is right. my point. So, and, um, yeah. And even, even kids YouTube, certain mm -hmm. things sneak in there. Yeah. I remember my niece, my niece had nightmares for like a week because she saw a cat torture video that was snuck in there. Oh my God, yes, yeah. okay, yeah. And, and, and you know, on the on the, uh, the little uh, picture or whatever, the thumbnail, it was like normal, happy, oh, funny cat videos. And then it was a cat mm -hmm. being put in a bag. Terrifying, and she oh, was very yeah. upset for obvious yeah. or who wouldn't be. Of course. Any normal person would be. Uh, yeah, so, you know, and that is like, so there are problems with YouTube and even kids YouTube and my husband and I just kind of decided that there'll be a time where, you know, like they're older and we could kind of discuss it with them. Um, mm. But we just were not going to do it. But even without that, you know, one of my sons and my sons are twins, pretends mm -hmm. he has an invisible phone and makes up invisible videos. And I don't know where it comes from. It's nuts. Like we're, we're cord cutters. We, it's crazy. Like, you know, like we have Hulu and we have Amazon and Disney plus 
but somehow he's gotten this whole world of videos so you know really wow. there's just so much so really like kids like royce are indoctrinated into certain things maybe without realizing that they're being indoctrinated and on the other hand you have um people like shosh who work their butt off and cannot rub two dimes together and you know are so far apart from this world um so that's that story there are other really great stories in your um your book i know you're a teacher and there's a really wonderful one about the teacher's lounge <laughs> thank you yeah it's uh gnats in the teacher's lounge it's based on a semi-true story that i experienced oh my god <laughs> not hey, anybody, not okay so if anybody actually re if anybody reads the book you'll know why i just said that <laughs> 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 I was I was working in um I was working in a district I won't say which I will tell you this the kids were fantastic um other things were not and one of them was this inescapable cloud of gnats literally in the teachers lounge and and we could not figure out where they were coming from we could not figure out how to get rid of them the custodial staff did absolutely nothing about it um and there, there wasn't a, an older female teacher who every time I or another teacher would propose a solution, she would cite OSHA violation. She, she would cite all of these things to not let us do it. And um, it was really gross. It was so disgusting. And uh, I'm glad I'm not there anymore. Yeah, I'm glad that you're not there anymore either. That story was really, really good. Um, it oh, was by you. far one of my favorites. Oh, uh, so yeah, so it's so all the stories sort of run um, the gamut between, um, you know, there's different kinds of supernatural or just psychological in, you know, your mind. Um, and there's a few, so there's also a thread of a, of a um, is it Resting Hollow? Yes, yeah. So that's, of a town uh, yeah. um, that sort of connects some of the stories. How did you decide to do that? I love Washington Irving so, so, so much. Um, I know like uh, some people see him as like a very problematic figure nowadays. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just love his work. I can separate the artist from the art, you know, Lovecraft and all that. It's yes, he was racist, but at the same time, he invented quiet horror. Um, so I love Washington Irving and I wanted to have, and I love the Sleepy Hollow area so, so much. It's and I really, to, it's really fabulous up there. Oh, it's heaven. I, I, oh, if I could afford to live there, I totally would. <laughs> but uh, I wanted my own Sleepy Hollow-esque town where I could build all of this mythology around one area in the same way that um, the Tarrytown Sleepy Hollow-ish area has the, the legend of the crone. It has the, um, the uh, creatures in the mountains, the Rip Van Winkle concept, the, you know, the, the Headless Horseman, all of that stuff. And it's a very haunted um, city or town, whatever you want to say. So I wanted to kind of create my own version of it. And I've, I've started building it out even further. Um, I have a story that's going to be published in another collection, uh, actually coming out in October. Um, and that story that's in there incorporates a, sort of a neighboring town. And uh, so I'm, I'm slowly building out this weird little universe in like my own fictional upstate type area, Westchester -y, um region. So yeah, I just, I love the idea of, you know, Stephen King does it, all of his stuff is set in the same universe and obviously the Marvel movies and some of the DC movies seem to be set everywhere, you know, so I wanted to have everything be in one uh, central universe. Um, it was, yeah, it was really, it was really good. And for a second, I kind of had to be like, oh, is this an actual Hudson Valley town? And then I'm like, oh, no, it's, this is, it's really good. And uh, yeah, oh, Sleepy Hollow is fabulous. And their cemetery, very sadly, at the moment, um, you know, they're not doing tours, but um, I've taken the night tour. And they're somebody I would love to have on the podcast to talk about um, what they do. Yeah, so um, yeah, so Sleepy Hollow, it's just a, it's a really good town. And I think like, you know, it's great that there's so much lore. Um, and I, I get 
wanting to kind of tap into that. I think you did it really, really well. Um, are there oh, other stories that are like favorites of yours? In that collection, I definitely like the novella a lot. I really, I put a lot into that one. And I, I really, really love uh, that one a lot. But I, I really enjoy, um, I'm getting a lot of nice feedback on Apple Valley. That, which, was, a, uh, that was a really good one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm getting a lot of nice feedback on that. So I appreciate that. And um, that's actually the only story in the collection that wasn't planned, that I didn't plot every single thing out with. So that was kind of like a weird exercise for myself. Um, I really enjoy Kelly Wash the Stars also because I, I didn't want to um, have a character defined by that one aspect. And according to my beta readers, I accomplished that, I hope. Um, but I, I just really, I, I love the idea of someone being so angry at such a powerful force and then confronting that force and essentially coming out on top. Yeah. So what do you have in store, uh, for the future? Awesome. I am, uh, I have a bunch of stories coming out in anthologies, uh, this year and next year as well. I completed a young adult sci-fi horror novel that I am in a, a rewrite of right now. And I have two other YA uh, novels that I'm working on. I've written about 50 pages of one and I wrote about eight pages of another. And I am compiling a third collection that will hopefully be out in 2021 or 22. And I am starting my first full length horror novel that, um, I'm keeping very close to the vest, but when I've told certain people about what it's like, what the concept is, the reactions have been, oh, like I've gotten a lot of cringing from it and I've gotten a lot of uncomfortable uh, reactions. So it lets me know that I'm on the right track. <laughs> Well, I'm really excited to see what comes next from you. And I do hope that you will join us again. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. Um, so uh, this is Jessica and my guest has been Robert Otone. Thank you and so much. Thank you. And we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode. Thank you.